Hello everyone and a super warm welcome to Ericsson Imagine Life's Business Lounge where we will have a close look at the recipe for successfully accelerating 5G in a sustainable way. I'm Lena Forsberg and I have the great pleasure to be your moderator during this session. And in today's webinar, we will focus on uh, the building blocks of the networks of the future. We will explore how Ericsson are supporting customers in their sustainability journey. And then we will zoom into one of the network's components, namely the 5G antennas. And during the session, I will be joined by Ericsson experts, and we are so happy to also welcome our customer Optus, who will join us from the other side of the globe. Uh, before we kickstart this session, I would like to share some practicalities. So we have a dedicated time for audience questions during the session. Uh, and you, we really encourage you to send in your question. And you do so via the chat box, which you find underneath the main screen. And we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible, both by the speakers here in the studio, as well as our experts online. But should we not have time to answer your question during the live broadcast, then rest assured we will follow up uh, during the next day or so with a response via email. So with that, I think it's time to get this party started. And our first expert to share her insight is Dr. Sibel Tombas, head of 5G RAN product line at Ericsson. Hello, Sibel. Hello, Lena. <laughs> How are you doing today? Very well. Thank you very much. Great to have you be here. Yeah, great to have you. Uh, and I mean, we all know that the networks of today, they are capable of proce processing exabytes of data globally uh, and also provide connectivity with high resilience and high quality. Um, but if we look at the needs of tomorrow in order to cater for those needs, how can we evolve the networks to become more flexible and dynamically adaptable? Yes. Now, I think it's a very good question. Uh, I think we first of all probably celebrate ourselves what we have achieved in in very short time uh, in uh, mobile communication. As you said, today's the networks are capable of processing exabytes of data and provide connectivity to the billions of people in the world. And I think if you just compare, like in the last 40 years, kind of having a connect wireless connectivity has become going from a being a luxury to actually become a basic need. And all of them has achieved, I mean, in a very, very short time. But again, if you just look at still how networks are processing today and how they're running today, they are, we can kind of resemble them like a machine. And, and like machines, they need to be configured properly. They need to be exact to tell how, what kind of objectives they need to be handled. And they are still quite static in the way that, I mean, you need to really tell the, the, the objectives and how, how things need to be done. Uh, but we believe that this needs to change, and that because there are many things are changing uh, in, in environments around us, uh, networks becoming much more complex. We are seeing a huge demand for quite many use cases that will be connecting to these networks. So beside the, the billions of people, then we will be talking even higher number of connectivity. So we need to change, and we believe that networks of the future will be like an organism. Uh, and why we say organism? Because organisms evolve. Organisms are dynamic. Organisms understand the environment, they learn and they adapt. And I think these are extremely important characteristics of an organism. They are not static. And they're also energy conscious, which means that they really need to be careful on how much energy and resource they consume. And we believe that these are the characteristics that we are expecting from the networks of the future. And I think beyond all, what I think the biggest change that we are expecting from the future is that the networks will be intent-based. I think in that direction, which means that we don't not need to tell them exactly what needs to be done and how, but we need to tell our intent. What are we trying to achieve? And based on that, networks need to adapt towards that objective. So I think it's quite an uh, exciting time ahead. Uh, and I think, again, being proud of what we have achieved in the industry, but even more excited what is ahead. And we believe 5G will be the first step towards realizing this, uh, this vision. 
Mm. And you talked about what's ahead, and, and I think the next way of ID is about to kick off, and it will change the way we communicate, work, and live, and relate in society. Uh, so what are the key trends that Ericsson foresees, uh, and how can technology help us to, to leverage the full potential of the next wave of 5G? Yes. Yeah, I can definitely articulate and, and try to explain a bit. I mean, first of all, um, I think we can start with where we are, where we are in 5G. I mean, it is now fourth year uh, in, on where we are in 5G, and I think we can definitely say that we have built a great innovation platform that is now available more than 200 networks globally, and we are very proud of Ericsson that more than 60% are, are powered uh, by our networks. Uh, and I think in this first wave until now, we had focus on creating a quite mature network with multiple layers, with low bands, mid band, high bands, to create great experience, great user throughput, and of course, much better um, overall throughput uh, in, in the network. Um, and I think these networks are also quite flexible right now in the way that we can adapt to different service needs, we can create it slices in it instantly. So I think I would say that where we are right now after four years is, is really quite mature network, quite mature ecosystem. And that's why I believe now the time to go to next wave. And I think next wave for me in the 5G is uh, time to harvest. Because even when you are looking right now, even the network is super capable, and we are having the first steps for bringing new innovations and, and, and uh, um, uh, use cases, I think the main scale will really happen in the next wave, and, and uh, we will be bringing, and we will basically using 5G what is intended, which is one big innovation platform with multiple use cases. So in that direction, I will say there are a few trends uh, that I can maybe summarize. One in the consumer space, uh, and in the consumer space, I think we are expecting a quite a big change and almost, almost like a paradigm shift in how we communicate with XR. I mean, XR, AR, this is the domain that I think is really expecting in the midterm. And with the change of experience on how we are kind of having this more uh, uh, immersive experience in how we even personally communicate and also some applications even for, for other industries, I think this we expect a quite a big uh, shift uh, in, in, in our communication. And when we look at our projection, we are expecting that by 2027, there will be more than 100 million XR and AR devices. And then I think it will be even more scale after that time. So it is quite exciting what's happening in this domain. Uh, the second part is, of course, industries. And we are, have been focusing and, and talking a lot about what 5G can bring to enterprises. Because we believe, due to the capability that 5G have with high performance and security, and the capabilities that the networks are, are this ent enterprise are missing today, it can really bring a disruption. In disruption in the way how they operate today, how can they make them more automated, more simple, but also what kind of additional capabilities that they can bring, which they don't even experience today. And it can be any way from like remote uh, kind of pro process automation in terms of like positioning of the equipments. I mean, there are basically tons of different applications that will really bring innovation to the enterprise. And I think this is also another big trend uh, that we are seeing right now. And I think the third one, uh, I will say, I think this is actually almost kind of integration of two big technology trends that's happening in our time right now. And that is AI and ML, uh, artificial intelligence, and 5G at the same time. So I think currently we are discussing both, but I think the integration of these two technologies, and I think now uh, coming into, into run, we believe this will be creating another big, um, big change towards our vision of intent-based and uh, like an organism-type network. And I think this is, this is also quite, uh, quite exciting steps. But again, all of them will not happen uh, uh, from one day to another. We need to continue accelerating these networks because when we look at today, still 80% of the networks are sites are missing mid-band, which means that we haven't yet provided the premium connectivity everywhere. So we need to focus on acceleration of 5G and, and we need to focus on bringing new innovations to make that vision rea realizable. And as a result, we believe that these networks, again, will be able to handle all these different type of devices from a every small sensor in, an in, in the factory to a very, very complex AR glasses in the middle of the city. And all of them needs to be handled by by single network. And as I said, we have to enhance the coverage and capacity. Even though we had done a, a great job in the first four years, I would say there are more work to be done to bring the connectivity to everywhere. 
Uh, another area that we need to focus on, I think it's almost like a paradigm shift in the way we design networks, is going from a best effort thinking to more guaranteed, consistent experience. So it will not be a, a more about more throughput, more latency, low, low latency. It will be about consistent throughput, consistent latency. This is what will be needed in these networks. And of course, as the best and um, most important part of the, what we are bringing in the network is resilience. And that has to stay and that will be the different, the big differentiator of mobile networks in general. So overall, I would say a long <laughs> answer, but I think a, a quite exciting again future also for 5G uh, next wave. Uh, and I think we are we are very prepared uh, to achieve this with Ericsson. Sounds great. Uh, so, I mean, now, um, if how can we make 5G networks more sustainable while, while still continuing to enhance these capabilities that you mentioned, like improved performance, lower latency, and being able to manage larger data volumes? What yes. do you say? No, I think this is, uh, I mean, the simple answer is we have to do all this uh, with less. <laughs> we need to bring more throughput, lower latency, more capacity while reducing the power cost or energy consumption, I would say. And I think because this is not an option anymore. I think this is really, we take it as an industry responsibility. While mobile communication in general helping the other industries to reduce their energy consumption and also helping their sustainable targets, but still we need to do our part uh, we cannot sacrifice from the connectivity because this is key for society, but at the same time, we definitely need to deliver more with lower and lower energy consumption. Mm. Yeah, and talking about sustainability, a, a, a growing number of the service providers now are uh, leading when it comes to uh, sustainability. And according to GSMA, 61% of mobile industry uh, sorted by revenue then have committed to reach net uh, zero by 2050 or earlier, of course. And, and service providers also have a key role to enable this transformation for society with, with digitalizing our networks and so on. Uh, but of course, they also have their own challenges that they are facing, like data growth, energy costs, and, and not at least their own net zero targets. So how would you say that Ericsson can help our customers with these challenges and their sustainability journeys? Yes. No, indeed, and I think it is definitely a big focus area for us, and I can try to explain how in this trend, in this, in this joint goal, uh, we as Ericsson can help, of course, our customers and CSP and also our own contribution. So, I mean, I think, as you said, uh, climate crisis is definitely the biggest human challenge we are facing right now, and I think we as people and anyone in this industry or on the globe, how we react and how we act is going to change of the future and what kind of future we are going to leave to our grandchildren and children. So I think for that we definitely have quite ambitious targets and we have measurable, uh, measurable targets on the way. So I think our biggest target right is basically we aim to be total net zero by 2040. And that is across all our portfolio. And towards that target we have defined two key milestones for midterm, which is 2025. And with the first target, we aim to reduce the energy, uh, the carbon footprint from our supply chain by 36% by 2025, which means that we need to consider everything we do in our hardware design, what kind of aluminium and all the metal consumption, all of them, so that we are, and also with our suppliers, try to reach this target. And the second one has a quite a direct impact to, of course, the CSPs and our customers. And we have a clear target to reduce the energy consumption of a typical site by 40% compared to 2021. I mean, these are definitely quite ambitious targets. And, and we believe this will help, again, uh, us uh, and our responsibility and also of our customers. But one thing is, of course, bring the products uh, bring the right material, bring the right products with lower power consumption in the market. But the other one is realizing in the field, because at the end we have a huge install base with a co a quite a big power cons energy consumption happening. So what we now focusing on, how can we bring this innovation uh, to, to the field? How can we see this kind of gains and, and reduction uh, uh, externally? And here we have basically three pillars to help the CSPs to break the energy curve. I will say the first one is the network evolution and design. So here basically everything starts, what are your objectives when you are planning your network? 
and, and so far everything's about quality, performance, capacity, which is of course understandable, but we believe that there needs to be a mindset shift and energy efficiency and energy consumption has to be included as an important KPI when you're making network planning. That's, I think, definitely number one pillar. The second one is modernization and ex expanding. And I think we are actually quite good place right now because, as I said, 5G needs to be accelerated. We need to go and focus on bring this kind of premium connectivity everywhere. But when we are doing this acceleration and modern uh, kind of going to the site, we need to look at the overall site when we are adding the 5G spectrum and 5G radios. So again, like looking into the, the old hardware and looking into the kind of higher consumption the equipment that is there and how can we reduce the power consumption, uh, energy consumption that side is extremely important. And finally, after the network is planning done, there's modernized, we need to of course operate intelligently, which means that we need to reduce the energy consumption during the day to ensure that the consumption is adapted to the traffic in a very intelligent way so we don't waste any energy uh, during the operation. So, so very ambitious targets indeed, uh, but it seems like it's coupled with a, a very detailed plan on how to get there. Uh, and I know that Ericsson has a roadmap to push the technology to do more with less. Yes. Uh, but can you share uh, the progress already made and maybe give uh, some examples of new solutions? Yeah, of course, no, I will be very happy to, because as I said, at least for us when we do the product design, energy efficiency is for us, an important target as, a, as an input. And that is basically for both hardware and software design, it is there from, from the beginning. And we take all the high-level targets, of course, as a company, to heart and, and to ensure that we, we execute accordingly. And I'm very proud to say that already today, we are executing towards our target. We even aim to be over target, uh, let's see, in 2025. But if I just look at today, when we go to, we, with the solutions and the hardware and software products we have, we can bring 10 times more capacity, which means that we can handle all this traffic, bring premium connectivity to an existing site that doesn't have 5G, while reducing the overall energy consumption of the site by 30%. It's, I think, an amazing achievement because it means that we already broke the energy curve. We already can bring a new technology without adding the power energy consumption of the site. And we have an ambition to do go further, in the next one to two years to further ex increase the capacity and still co uh, reduce the consumption by 40%. Maybe a few examples. I mean, first of all, 5G is designed from the beginning for to be more energy efficient. Actually, I am quite proud because I also have been in, a, in Ericsson Research by the time when we were uh, looking into the 5G uh, the, uh, lean design and how can we create it so that we can have deeper sleep. So which means that our 5G networks already in the beginning designed with energy efficiency in mind uh, and that definitely brings us quite big advantage. The second, we have Ericsson Silicon, and I think this is kind of our secret sauce, because that enables us in our hardware to bring more with less. We can bring more bandwidth, more capacity, more throughput, but still lower consumption. I think that it was the key for us in our portfolio. And we have launched in Barcelona several products, both in Massimo and also remote uh, radios, where you can, we can basically bring higher throughput with lower energy consumption. And, and I can give one, uh, AR6646, one of the rural radios, which is triple site, triple sector, basically can do a job of nine single radios. So when you go to a site, you can basically modernize your network, remove nine radios and change with one. It's, it's, it's a huge saving just with one, one item. But as I am a software person, so I need to touch upon some software features as well. So even though we have the perfect products, hardware is deployed on the site, we are bringing a lot of software features to, again, optimize the energy consumption during the day. So we are able to switch off the power amplifier in a microsecond level or some of the antenna elements in, the, in a very short time, or we can switch off the whole cell depending on the traffic. So which itself means that the site consumption also varies and we are intelligently operating that uh, uh, with software as well. So impressive achievements, I must say. Uh, let me now see if we have any questions uh, from the audience online. Uh, yes, here we have one. Uh, how will the long-term shift uh, towards higher frequencies and the resulting increase in the number of sites impact your energy consumption per gigawatt trends? 
Yes, I think this is very much related to what we also achieve. Maybe the question is more future term, but if I just focus on right now, as you know, 5G, the main spectrum, or what we call the gem of the spectrum right now, is what we call the mid-band TDD, which is 3.5 gigahertz uh, area. And with our solutions today, we are managing to put these micro 3.5 gigahertz radios in the existing sites, so no need to densify, but we don't increase the total energy consumption of the site. I think these are the kind of examples also I presented in the previous. And I believe we will continue the same trend. So when we have a new spectrum, let's say 6 gigahertz, 7 gigahertz later, we will exactly go with the same mindset. How can I add 7 gigahertz spectrum with certain bandwidth and still the total energy consumption is reduced? So I would say, I think we now broke the energy curve the first time. Uh, this adding technologies with lower energy consumption is achieved. Uh, and I think we know the, how to do it also going forward. So, so let me, one more question, uh, very short, uh, and that is, what measure is Ericsson using for your energy saving targets? Are you using kilowatt per hours or gigabit per kilowatt per hours? Yeah. No, it's a good question, actually. It's very important what you measure. We measure absolute energy consumption, so kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. So we don't make any normalization because normalization gives some uh, a, a bit maybe different different feelings. So we, what we are measure is what is important for sustainability and what is important for energy bill, and that is kilowatt an hour. That's our targets. Thank you, Sibel, a and thank you for sending in your questions. And please continue to do so because we also have experts online who can help answer your questions. So it has been great to learn about all the technology innovations which will help us provide sustainable networks with higher performance. Uh, but now we will go from theory to practice as we will be joined by our customer Optus who will share what they are doing to accelerate 5G in a sustainable way. And it's uh, a great honor for me to welcome Kent Wu, Vice President of Access Network Strategy, Planning and Quality at Optus. Hello, Kent. Hi, Lina. Thank you for joining us on this broadcast. So happy to see you. Hi, I'm glad to meet everyone here digitally through the Teams. So, so when I think of Optus, uh, speed is probably the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, and I know that together with Ericsson, you have smashed several speed records throughout the years. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that you're also setting a very high bar when it comes to scaling 5G in a sustainable way. Uh, I mean, last year you announced a widespread um, a widespread uh, upgrade to many of your sites with a unique energy efficient radio and baseband solution, uh, which we have developed together with Ericsson. Uh, so, so can you please elaborate a bit uh, on that and, um, and, and let us know the process of this collaboration uh, and the innovation that we had between Optus and Ericsson and, and, and what that led to in terms of creating this solution. Yeah, sure, thanks. So today I'm really glad to you know, share with everyone here um, a few slides that we prepared to explain how we are on this journey to accelerate the 5G in a more sustainable way and to um, elaborate the collaboration Optus and Ericsson has together on the energy efficiency and sustainability initiatives. So um, if you look at our um, high level vision targets, Optus has the vision and target to reduce 25% of the carbon footprint by 2025, you know, very similar to what Dr. Siebel has just mentioned earlier in her presentation, that we have a very aligned goal in the um, carbon uh, footprint um, reduction, and also 50% by 2030. And to build a sustainable and environmentally friendly mobile network. Our aim is to collaborate with our vendors, customers, and partners to reduce the climate risk and to achieve the global goal of no more than 1.5 degrees of the warming. And to achieve these targets, we have three pillars of actions, as you can see on this page. Firstly, we take actions on operational carbon and embodied carbon by introducing the new generation equipment 
and implementing energy saving features and optimizing designs, as well as improved supply chain process. And the second pillar is that we proactively look into mitigating the risks associated with flooding, fire, or power supply disruptions to the Optus network's assets. And these actions result in the networks being more resilient and better collaboration with national and federal gov government and the other telco operators on disaster recovery mechanisms too. And the third action pillar is that we double down on the circular economy initiatives by reusing, recycling and reducing materials in everything that we do. And for example, if you can see, we build greener base stations and upgrading existing sites with the greener concrete and steel in materials in our, uh, in our uh, civil build works, and also to use more lithium ion uh, batteries to improve the battery efficiencies and to recycle materials and process in the um, build of the 5G network. And next, um, I will give a few more specific examples on Optus' success in building the Australia's most energy efficient uh, networks and base stations while we take the 5G speed leadership as well, as Lena, you mentioned. Um, this is a site in Moorbank uh, Moor Bank in one of the fastest growing residential areas in, in Sydney. And we collaborated with Ericsson team from design of the site to build to construct and to optimize the features, et cetera, to break the energy curve on the site and to still Im, uh, improve on 4G, 5G overall custom experience. And as you can see that on this site, we modernized the hardware with the state-of-the-art Ericsson radio and the baseband equipment, significantly improving the energy efficiency. For example, um, the uh, Ericsson Air 6419, which is uh, the the uh, uh, Mesa MIMO active uh, antenna unit um, that has really lowered the power consumption and at the same time improved coverage and capacity, consolidating the single and the dual band radios to tri band radio, um, the 4485, for example, and as well as new generation of the 2300 um, AAUs, the Air 3219. And that can help us to run the multi-mode, the band 40, um, 2300, LT and NR 5G technology uh, uh, simultaneously, rather than the historical, you know, two separate equipment used for 4G and 5G. So all this modernization by using the multi-band, multi-technology Ericsson hardware has really helped to drive and to fast track the, um, the, the site deployment and energy efficiencies. You can see that we reduce from the 12 classic radios to six on per site level, and the weight reduced from the 44 kilo to 20 kilo per active antenna unit, and 53 kilograms to 45 kilograms for any of the, uh, for those uh, classic radio units as well. And then we implemented the advanced Ericsson software features as well, such as the 4G micro TX and cell sleep, 5G NR micro, sleep, uh, micro TX and, uh, and, and deep sleep. And, target to, and we are targeted to Im, uh, implement the massive MIMO sleep mode as well in Q4 this year. The result, as you can see on this page, is that total 4G, 5G traffic has increased by 11% after we modernized the site, while we improved the energy consumption um, uh, on the per site level uh, in terms of measurement by kilowatts hours per gigabyte of delivery, um, that by 29% improvement. So on the site basis, you can see that our daily energy consumption has reduced by 22%. Uh, in conjunction with the hardware modernization features implementation that I talked about. So this is indeed not a myth that to you know, you know we can improve the 5G coverage capacity at the same time achieving the energy uh, efficiency gains as well. It is achieved through a careful and a strategic planning, tailored design and implementation, and follow through with features and optimization with our partner like Ericsson. Next, I will go to the following slide um, 
to explain a bit more of the program level, what are the things that we are doing on this hardware and the software, and also related, um, you know, the tangible um, megawatts hours of energy savings, etc., and the CO two emission uh, emission uh, reduction. So Optus has been really continuously uh, making progress and driving uh, this rent energy saving as we roll out the five G networks with Ericsson. Here you can see that we have large programs for energy saving features development and optimization and technology cycle, uh, life cycle management as well. So today we have implemented 5G, 4G, 5G micro TX sleep, um, 4G cell sleep mode, AI powered MIMO sleep mode, um, and even the 2300 5G, um, uh, the deep sleep mode through the automate, automated scripts. And these benefits have really demonstrated very clearly as the chart or, or as the table here showed on the right hand side. For the last 15 to, to uh, 12 to 15 months, as you can see that we have saved uh, 1,936 million watts hour of energy, which is equivalent to 1,723 tons of CO2 emission reduction. And in parallel, we have also targeted a program to shut down our 3G 2100 layer uh, on site, me meaning that we go to the site and physically switch off those radio, those baseband's associated with the 3G 2100 layer since last year. And not only by just locking the cells remotely, as I said, that we actually go onto the site to physically turn off those hardware to further save the energy. So again, in this activity alone, um, in the last 12 to 15 months period, as you can see that we have saved 11,097 million watts hours of energy across the entire network. And that is equivalent to 9,876 tons of CO2 emission reduction. And imagine what that ex exactly means, you know, in terms of the, what, what's the scale that the energy can do. This is enough to power around 14,281 Sydney homes for a whole year. We are not stopping here just yet as our networks will evolve and with further 5G rollout and technology refresh programs. Working with the Ericsson headquarters and the uh, and R&D teams, we are developing more energy efficient equipment, energy saving features and new processes, ways of working to bring and to really reach the sustainability goals um, and bring the benefit to the, to the environment. And to name a few examples of such R&D collaboration and efforts, we are one of the first operators directly working with Ericsson R&D on 5G bolster carrier um, sleep mode and the massive MIMO sleep mode. And by giving a lot of suggestions and validating together with the Ericsson team on actual algorithms, thresholds, etc., we're also looking into the CSOM based AI and machine learning enhancements on the power consumption optimization as well. With all these numbers, initiatives and detailed explanation, I hope this short presentation has really given everyone a good insight of how Optus is able to accelerate the 5G rollout in a more sustainable way. And we look forward to the collaboration with everyone else in this industry, including Ericsson on this journey. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Kent, for, for sharing this case with us. And it's amazing to see what we can achieve when we work together. Fantastic. Um, so Optus has made a commitment to net zero emissions. Uh, but how do you balance the immediate need for expanding and enhancing the network with the more long term goal of reducing uh, emissions? I think these two goals are um, not in contradiction and, uh, you know, they work, as I mentioned, that we have to find ways to um, reach both goals and work together, right? So um, we do a couple of things together with our partner, Ericsson. For example, from the design opt um, optimization, I mentioned that how do we balance the capacity coverage and performance versus the energy consumption and sustainability using the latest generation of the hardware, using the latest generation of the multi-mode, multi-band technologies, um, some of 
the, these, you know, as I mentioned in the uh, uh, presentation, that Ericsson really developed very good products um, in the classic radio space and uh, as well as in the active radio uh, antenna space as well. And third point is developing those energy efficiency features through the software optimization, through the software development. I think that really gives us a huge gain uh, while maintaining or achieving the custom experience balance. And last but not least is really to look at the supply chain and the logistics improvements. Use the recyclable materials um, as we do the site rollout with uh, reduced number of hardware on the tower that helps us actually to reduce the cement, to reduce the steel um, that we use as material to build the towers and to build the sites. So all these initiatives work in parallel um, to make a good fine balance between achieving the long-term goals um, such as energy sustainability, but at the same time achieving the faster 5G rollout and a better customer experience as well. Sounds like you have a solid plan in place and we're so happy to support you on your journey. Thank you so much, Kent, for joining us in this live broadcast. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. So let's now move focus from the network level and instead zoom in on the antennas as one of the components of building performant, resilient and sustainable networks. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to now introduce Bastian Morillo, head of antenna solutions at Ericsson. Hello, Bastian. Hi, Lena. Pleasure to be here. A pleasure to have you, uh, indeed. Uh, so we heard Sibel and Kent uh, talk about that performant and efficient networks is now a key requirement. Uh, and that means, of course, building out coverage and capacity, but it also means redefining the relationship between gigabits and kilowatts and make the network equipment more energy efficient, more spectral efficient uh, as well, and, of course, making all that possible while reducing the footprint. So what role do antenna system play in all this? Yes, so I think Sibel and Kent uh, greatly explained uh, how we as at Ericsson tackle the big challenge of our time, um, where we see uh, digitalization and connectivity um, being an enabler for more, more um, use cases, more opportunities for industries and societies. Um, this is resulting in constantly growth of the usage um, and as well in the network complexity. At the same time, to be more sustainable is a must nowadays. Um, so we are following our path um, to, net, to net zero. And all of that at the same time needs to remain affordable for, for our customers. Um, and uh, this is of, course, uh, is of course a challenge. So on the first side, those targets um, seem to be contradicting. Um, but if you want to have especially um, or reach those um, very important and seemingly contradicting targets, you need to address that with all the parts of the network. And so, of course, also with the antenna system. Um, so in the past, um, the, uh, the role of antennas was often underplayed. Um, many people looked at it as a commodity. Um, but that is what we see what is actually not true. Um, while making great progress in AI and software features, um, highly specialized chips like our Ericsson Silicon and so on, um, we sometimes tend to overlook the importance of, of the basic hardware. Um, and, uh, and in today's and, and modern 5G network systems, um, this, is, uh, this will be crucial, especially as we see the margins on performance um, uh, getting smaller, um, the, the impact of the antenna will be decisive for network performance. Um, the antennas are actually the gateway to the 5G networks. This is the product that is connecting our users out there um, with, our, with our networks. So it's super important and exactly that part is, of course, uh, does matter. Um, so um, in, this, in this transformation, we see that the um, value proposition of antennas is evolving. Um, so in the past, maybe it was good enough to have a basically good single band, dual band, quad band antenna whatsoever, but the requirements of um, and the expectations towards antennas are significantly increasing. Um, so we at Ericsson Antenna Systems, we're focusing on actually three major topics. 
Um, the one is being um, low total cost of ownership. Um, antennas remain typically quite a long time in, in the networks. So the, the lever to actually avoid costs, reduce cost of operation, is, is a quite big one. Um, and we are looking on this from different angles and we want to help our operators to prove their balance sheet and monetize on 5G. The second thing is durable multiband performance. We heard that um, connectivity is getting a natural part of people's life. So everyone is expecting well-performing connectivity everywhere. Um, and this, of course, um, we need to support um, with the antenna system. So uh, we can't allow creeping performance over time. So constant and reliable high performance over many years is a must. The third and last but not least um, port part is maximized efficiency and sustainability. As you can imagine, this is a rather wide topic and we're trying to address it from as many angles as possible. Um, so there are, there are choices that you can make on material, um, there, are par there are choices on transportation that you can do um, up to technology solutions um, where we really focus on how to make our customers succeed. So, um, you can say Ericsson is driving a paradigm change also in this domain. Um, we focus on integration density, we focus on PIM performance, um, we, we focus on wind load because we believe really that those are targets that are critical to network but also to business KPIs. Um, so this is about the now. If we look a little bit further into future, we really believe this will be evolving to antennas that are aware about their environment, that behave differently depending on where you put them, and they will be natural part of self-optimizing uh, networks. So meta services and sensors will play an important role. Already today, we see that antennas are becoming an integrator for new technology, for existing technologies, but of course also new and future technologies. So um, there are thoughts about antenna-centric um, centric site designs where you're really focused on putting as much as you can into one product, into one solution. Um, the other extreme, but this is what we also expect, and this is that in, um, in spaces or areas where you can't allow to mount antennas, we really see that antennas will be merging into the environment, um, that they will be integrated in things, um, in things like buildings, windows, glass, um, and basically disappear from um, what we see from day to day. And of course, all those challenges, um, configurations, um, and adap adaptations um, need to be solved without sending people to the site. So zero touch is a topic that is high on the agenda um, and that we are focusing for our customers as well. Overall, we framed that challenge um, as uh, not just more, as we said before, but really, really more with less. Uh, we want to connect our customers to a world of new revenue possibilities with at the same time much lower TCO and a significantly lower energy footprint. So we heard about the why, uh, better performance, better efficiency, and I must say amazingly lower total cost of ownership. Uh, but can you tell me also about the how? I mean, what features and innovations will support service providers uh, to have a sustainable and efficient network deployment and operation? What do you say? Yeah, ab absolutely. So I think we have heard um, from Kent who showed us that Optus is focusing on two major building blocks. Um, the one is carbon emissions, the other one is circular economy. And so do we. So we and Ericsson Antenna Systems, we were pioneering and building sustainable packaging. We were the first in this industry, well recognized by customers and analysts to basically remove all plastic, all foam um, from, from the packaging um, to make it 99.7% uh, actually um, recyclable. Um, the other thing is that we offer, as Ericsson, for our products a take-back service. This is free of charge, and because we want to ensure that proper handling and recycling for all the products, the packaging and the product itself, is happening. Um, so, but what we also see is that actually not all of the targets are really contradicting in the end. Um, so a good example for that is energy efficiency. Um, we see that energy efficiency is, of course, helping with the lower TCO, but at the same time reducing um, or focusing on our sustainability targets. 
Um, so, and when we started to talk about energy efficiency in Antenna some years ago, um, people were wondering how a passive product um, can help on this. And while we have very detailed discussions in some areas, um, just as example, power systems, where we talk about small differences, um, people tended to overlook that an antenna um, was sometimes wasting up to 40% of the carefully generated RF power just into heat. So, so this is a lot, and with our um, high-efficiency antennas um, that we have in our portfolio, we are able to cut those uh, losses to half. So quite, quite, good, um, quite good progress on that end. Um, but you can't talk about antenna efficiency, which is describing the energy that you put into the antenna and that then gets r radiated somewhere, um, without talking about where actually this energy is radiated to. Um, so because what we want is um, that the energy is radiated to the sector, that's where the customer sits, um, that is where we want the energy to be. Um, but of course, um, every product is also, or every antenna is also um, radiating to other directions. Um, that can be just be wasted energy, um, but in worst case, this is even creating interference. The term that we introduced um, for that roughly two years ago was beam efficiency. Um, so, and this is this is um, how we actually um, frame that, so that we say not only the antenna needs to be efficient, but also the beam where it's actually going needs to be efficient. Um, and our latest antenna models with the invisible radiator technology really excel in this domain. Um, so there we see that we increase performance um, by reducing interference um, and at the same time saving cost for the operators and CO2 um, actually for the world. So I'd say that was a lot about the less already. Let's also talk a bit about the more part. So more coverage, more capacity and even more site space. Um, so when we, when we look at the lifespan of an antenna, the worst thing that can happen is actually a, s a slow degradation of performance. Um, PIM is a, such an example of an error that can grow over time and you have hard time to sometimes recognize. So we're at Ericsson, we're leading in the industry to find innovative solutions um, to optimize antenna design and reduce the lifetime impact actually. Um, and this is happening based on simulations, but also on harsh environmental testing that we're doing in our test technology center um, in Rosenheim. So um, this novel design approaches, that can really give you the little piece of extra performance and many more years of life. Um, one example of such innovations that we're doing are our vortex generators. Um, vortex generators are a small aerodynamic element that we put on the edges of the antenna um, and this is helping to streamline the airflow around the antenna and reducing, um, reducing the wind load that this is creating towards the structure by around about 20%. So quite a big impact by very small pieces. Um, another innovation um, that we lately launched was our ultra-wide low-band radiator. Um, so this is a radiator that covers um, from 600 all the way up to 900 megahertz actually in one go. So that means we are increasing the bandwidth of that radiator by 43%, um, helping our customers avoiding a, sec a second antenna um, at, at the site. Um, integration of multiple capabilities as such is also key to extend and densify with minimal cost. The ultra-wide low-band radiator was one of those examples, but also our air interleaf products really deliver on that product. Um, it's in enabling the CSP to scale 5G midband, deploy it on, on sites where it would be hard or impossible maybe um, to deploy them otherwise. So as said in the beginning, we're working on an upward spiral where innovation and new technology help to, do, to reduce operational expenses, become more su sustainable and bring 5 g flawlessly into the networks. That sounds great. Uh, but let's again move from theory mm -hmm. to practice. And you talked earlier about uh, antennas being uh, decisive in determining performance. You mentioned throughput and coverage gains. Yes. Uh, and I know that Ericsson recently performed a benchmarking study that confirms just that. Uh, so I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about the, the learnings and findings of that study. Yes, of course. Um, so, so our antennas are delivering reliable performance 
all around the globe um, since more than 30 years actually um, in many different places, different environments and so on. Um, what is now new is that with Ericsson's deep network expertise we get much more um, insights into actually network performance. So what, what we now like to do is do like for like benchmarks where we take out certain parts of the network, replace with other parts and see how different components, different building blocks of a network um, influence the performance of the network. Um, and we have done such benchmarking activities around the antennas lately um, in different places like the US, uh, like in Spain, um, and actually, as you said, a very comprehensive one in Northern Europe. Um, and um, in this case, the operator has um, tested uh, three different antenna vendors. Um, from, they are all from like the leading domain, um, leading group of antenna vendors around the world. Um, and they have changed um, the antennas, done KPI monitoring, um, have done drive tests before and after, um, and just s monitored how the performance of the network was, uh, was evolving. Um, and what we have seen is that um, we were able to um, increase, um, uh, increase throughput um, in the downlink and in the uplink, um, while we at the same time were able to reduce uh, the output power of the radios by 29%. So, so that is really showing how we can do more actually with, with less on the other side. So what we sh see is then in a, in a, in a balanced uh, way um, among the vendors that we were 7.5% um, more efficient with our antennas than the second um, actually in this rating. And we did not even touch all the potential um, for revenue savings because we didn't look at the low bands and of course we did not yet consider consider like reduced steel work and things like that. So, so really amazing. Well, that's, uh, that's really, really impressive. But, but then I, I, I must ask, uh, do we expect this to happen on every side or? Yes, good question. So not exactly like this, uh, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So this was, um, was an extraordinary case. Um, so that was really, really good results that we have seen. Um, but there is a trend and it really shows what, the, what potential high performing antennas can bring to today's networks. And this trend, this trend is also confirmed by the other tests that we are doing. Um, so we see also in other areas, um, in other tests that when we bring our antennas, we can um, increase um, the, uh, the user experience and reduce energy consumption at the same time. Um, key to achieve that is actually collaboration. So what we've seen is the earlier we have common goals with the operators, the earlier we talk and plan together, um, the better the results can be. And in the network-wide study that we have just done with a northern operator, um, with another northern operator, um, is that we see uh, a 5 to 10 percent reduction um, in um, in energy consumption on on a real on a full network level, um, so and then it's easy to calculate. That's that's a lot of money, um, and that's also a lot of CO two emissions. So so if you ask me just to name three takeaways in the end, so focus on also in case of antennas on the TCO to really see the long term value, um, introduce antenna systems early into the network planning, um, as we discussed also, as, and actually also can confirmed, talk early, have common goals, um, then you can maximize the impact. And the last thing is modern antenna systems are decisive now for network performance. They give you extra, um, extra performance where you need it um, and reduce energy footprint at the same time. Thank you, Bastian. And now let's see if we have any questions to you from the audience. Uh, yes, we do. We do have questions. Uh, here is one. Uh, you mentioned the emerging antenna paradigms. Uh, how is Ericsson Antenna preparing for 6D and above? <laughs> and is Ericsson looking at research in intelligent reconfigurable surface? How quickly can this technology be Product, productized, <laughs> productized. I think it says. <laughs> so, 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 very good question. Very precise. Very much forward leaning. Um, I like that. Um, so, actually, we have an, also in Ericsson Antenna Systems. We have a research team. Um, they are exactly focusing on those topics. They look on 6G and beyond. They are connected with different players um, in the university domain, but also in the industry domain, discussing materials, um, discussing uh, new ways of building and so on and so on. Um, actually, intelligence uh, reflecting surfaces are part of that. Um, so we're looking on that. So we're looking on the use cases um, that we can uh, achieve.
believe for that. Um, and we are monitoring closely when we believe the time will be right to actually bring those products uh, to the market. Good. I think we had time for one, one more question at least. Uh, let's, yes, this is a good one. What is the strongest technology of Ericsson antenna system compared to other competitors? Okay, <laughs> good one. Um, so I think we can say that we are clearly uh, leading in some areas um, like wind loads and, and so on. Um, but I would say we're talking about for antenna system for a reason, because antennas are really a system and the system is the star. Um, so a good feeding network is nothing without a good radiator and so on. So in the end, um, I wouldn't say there is like this one thing, um, but it's the components that really fit well together, that are well tested um, and, and designed with a lot of experience in mind um, that really make this um, an outstanding product. I think we have time for one more question, <laughs> uh, so let me see here. So we are hearing a lot about the beam efficiency these days, mm -hmm. you mentioned it as well. Uh, can you clarify how it is defined and calculated? Is there a difference with coverage efficiency? Mm -hmm. um, good, good that this question is asked, so maybe we, we clarify that. Um, actually, the term beam efficiency um, is not yet standardized. Um, so we have brought that into the market, into the think thinking some time ago. Um, and right now it's actually discussed at the standardization bodies how we kind of agree on how to measure that. Um, so today, different values on beam efficiency for diff from different vendors will not be 100% comparable because that's, that's not set. And of course, we all follow the same target. Um, which is describing how much of the energy is going into the sector, is not wasted and not causing interference. But on the details, like how we set the boundaries and so on, there might be difference. Um, and when, when talking um, and, uh, to customers and seeing what is happening in the industry, um, we actually see different names for it. Um, so one might call it uh, coverage efficiency, um, others might call it actually cell efficiency. Um, this is basically describing the same concept. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Bastian, for sharing your expertise and answering the questions. Uh, and of course, uh, thank you all for asking all these questions. It has been great with this interactivity during the webinar. And time flies when you're having fun and our broadcast is now coming to an end. Uh, and today's session focused on the recipe for successfully accelerating 5G in a sustainable way. In our next broadcast, Unleashing Network, performance excellence, we will share inspiring stories from 5G peace setters. So please join us on September 7, and you can easily register via the link shared in the chat. And of course, I also want to thank you all for taking the time to join us in this live webinar and engage with us on this platform. And we do appreciate getting your feedback because we also want to improve uh, and we want to make sure that we continue to deliver value to you. So please take a minute and answer the survey, which will appear on the screen shortly. Much appreciated. Uh, and also, of course, if you enjoyed this broadcast, then please keep commenting, sharing, and look out for the on-demand version. Thanks again for joining, and I do hope to see you back for the next session. Goodbye. <laughs>